Mark, I hear. <laughs> I know Mark Steckinger. We have talked oh, many. I know that voice. We. I, know. I am fine, Mark. How are you? Good, good. Like to look forward to being able to talk about one of my favorite movies of all time. Oh my God, you and me both, and it's all. There was no way I was going to let John Wick Four go by and not talk to you. We've talked about the other three. We we have to talk yeah. about four. You, you are good. All of you have taught me well, from Lon to Mangini to Hecker to, <laughs> to Hoganocker yourself. All as many guys as I've talked to at Formosa over the years, you guys have taught me well in the Sonic arena. So oh, that's good. And I'm glad we can contribute in some way. Oh my God, Mark! You guys have been so good to me over the years, and so many of you actually drove to Whittier to do live on the air and studio for my radio show. Oh. Yeah, I mean, you guys have just treated me like gold over the years, and I so appreciate it and love you oh, guys for it. Nice. But I got it's nice to be able to be part of something you like to do. So there you go. Ah, uh, well, I got to tell you, it's very evident that you and the whole Formosa team love doing John Wick movies. Uh, because what I have listened to, what I have heard over the four films, the sound is always incredible. The detail is always phenomenal. The layers, the nuance. You know, when I th didn't think you could do any better than what you had in the tunnels a couple movies ago, you top it again. But now with this film, I have to tell you, the sonic articulation is rapier. In this film, you have even more sonic elements than you've had in the other three films. New elements that we have not heard or experienced in a John Wick film. All of which then get layered in and edited in so incredibly sound. And the sonic palette is a character in this film in particular. And it is just off the charts perfection. But, uh, you know, it really does all come from Chad. This is the way he shoots his films. I mean, typically action films are cut to somebody coming towards you, cut to somebody getting hit, cut to this. And Chad, it's all orchestrated. It's like a ballet. It's like a dance. And so it's visually very rich. And because it's very visually very rich, it's, just, it's permission to be sonically rich. You know, the, yeah. the direction Chad gives on these movies and maybe in particular this fourth one, he says, I want this to be, I want you to lead with sound design, as he refers to all the sound effects work that we do. Yeah. And when it comes to the score, I want it to support it, but I don't want it to overwhelm it. Yes, there's going to be trade-offs at times, but for the most part, what I like, what the fan base likes, and of course what you sound guys like, is to put all that stuff in. I don't think he used the word stuff, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I know what word Chad used. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But so. this time around, uh, number one, you talk about the music, and I think one of the most exemplary aspects of a scene with the use of music is the waterfall fight scene in Berlin yeah. between Adkin, J Scott Atkins and Keanu. Got Adkin I mean, Adkins is one of the greatest martial arts action stars in, in film history. He truly is. And to see him and Keanu going at it, but with all of those elements there, visually, it's a stunner. I talked to Dan uh, Lawson about what he had to do with the lights to and the water to make things fall away around the fight. And if you did that also with the sound, so that we have all this techno sound, but our focus is still on the fight, and we get to that slow-mo sequence, and we can really hear. It's like you pull everything back during the slow-mo aspect so we can hear 
punches and thuds and thwaps and all of those elements. And it is just one of the most brilliantly designed segments that I've heard in a while. Oh, thank you very much. I mean, that's funny because every time a visitor would come to the stage, Chad would say, put up real five. That was real five. <laughs> so um, we played that a lot. So another, uh, it, it's an indication he's very proud of it too, which is uh, very complimentary. You know, how did you, and of course your designer, Alan Rankin, yeah, how, how did the two of you go about developing the sound for that sequence? Because the water, the steel, the concrete, the extremely high ceiling levels, there's, and the crowds, there's so much happening there we haven't seen in the previous three films. So how did you approach that sequence? Because it is such a standout. Well, the village that it took to get there is uh, Nate Orloff just orchestrated it, actually with um, the music originally. You know, he orchestrated the handoff from where the music was big to maybe where it was not, and or at least came up with those ideas. And then we took it and were able to take it even further by, you know, mixing this in a in a theater movie movie uh, dubbing stage, and sort of you can actually take those ideas and manipulate them even further, and then. You know, the sounds of the, like the water and the people, they're not real water sounds. They're like filtered whooshes, and you can, there's a lot of filter sweeps in it. Mm -hmm. Really, so nothing stands there and just builds up a noise floor, and it is always part of the scene. So, it's funny, I was just looking at that scene last night because I was talking to a class about it, and, you know, as soon as the fight happens and John's walking through the crowd, we just took all the sound out, and then he walks through a waterfall, and that's the switch to bring everything back in. And so in that scene, started with the music, like I said, back when, and then we were able to find other switches in the sequence. Uh, like maybe when he falls, just totally go to almost like a silence and make it kind of like a internalized sound. You know, when he falls to the top and he hits the pillar on the way down, he slaps on the floor. Like, we see a lot of water around him, but we're not playing it. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's out. And then it comes in as a filter sweep, comes back as he comes back. And so you're able to follow action like that, which is great. Um, and Andy Koyama, who mixed the music on that, just has such a way with frequencies that he was created space for all the other sounds that we wanted to put in. You know, for the hits and the guns, I mean, those are somewhat easier because, you know, they're sharp transients. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, you need space. If you want some low frequency, when you got driving low frequency in the music, you've really got to work that so you can get those sounds through and get it to sound the way you want. But, you know, in that scene, there's speed ramps that we pay uh, attention to with how the sound flows. And it was the most, let's say, esoteric and, and design se sequence, sequence, I'm sorry, of the whole movie. So it was uh, quite an opportunity to just have fun. Chad didn't dig into the specifics of what happens where. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, he, that's not the way he works with us. He gives big picture ideas and wants to see what we do with those thoughts. And uh, fortunately, with that particular scene, uh, he, was really, he was really happy with it. I can't think of any big note that he made anywhere in that scene. We love our dogs. Maybe we raise the dogs a little bit more when Tracker's dog attacks because <laughs> I don't know. But nonetheless, that was a fun scene on many different levels because for people who enjoy that, not only the orchestration of the scene like Nathan did, but you know, making it sound really interesting and unique, we just love that. That's that's what really interests us in what we do, and to have a free reign to do it was pretty pretty great. Yeah, and I I love how you mentioned the frequencies because you really can tell where things are falling off, and when frequencies you've got a lot of you've got more bass with that techno vibe happening, which then you counter that with those sweeps uh, and the wishes for water coming back in, and I just love that. I mean, it. Yeah, there's nothing steady state in that scene at all. Crowds, water, anyway. But then we get a scene like that. But then when you look at the rest of the film, and not only do we have new types of weaponry happening here, but uh -huh. the sound, um, due to the ambient locations, 
such as we've got a lot more breaking glass here in the Osaka Continental, multiple vehicles, new kinds of vehicles and motors, the motorcycle, the chase in Paris streets. We've got cobblestones. We've got horses galloping in the desert. But then you give us some of the most beautiful sonic elements. We get the hollowness of the church, the footsteps in the Louvre, and all it is is Winston walking one step at a time in the Louvre. And then even so much as to hear the granules of the sugar being picked up with a teaspoon and the granules falling into a cup, my God, Mark, that blew my mind. When I heard that, I was, I was, almost came out of my seat in the theater. Well, because those are all character things. Yes. And we really can make the most of them. Like, you use the sugar in the cup, and then because he's just a jerk, he's squeak, you know, that kind of squeak against porcelain with yep. when you stir. Like, let's do that. Let's make him annoying, you know. Um, he's annoying enough as it is, and let's, you know, if he, if he chews, he's going to chew with his mouth open. Little things like that you just add because you're just having fun with the characters. And, and accentuating whatever it is they do and whatever they need to be in the story. The way you've edited that and the modulation that you use for those things and what really impressed me, particularly with the sugar and being able to hear the granules in the theater, I thought I would lose that in watching it at home on television, on my, you know, on my TV, and I do not yeah. lose that. It is so, your, it, your sound is so meticulous. We don't lose any yeah. of those of uh, any of those elements that are not bang bang shoot them up. No, we don't. As a matter of fact, sometimes actually that's where we have our most fun. I mean, John Wick is known for the bang bang shoot them up in the fights, but as I uh, continue to like to say, it's all the other details, the textures, the environment, the world building, and sound is a huge part of that. And being able to um, find new ways to make something more articulate, more interesting. And interesting, I think, is a key buzzword here. Uh, it's just a, a great opportunity. You know, like you've identified the areas where, well, John Wick walks a lot or Winston walks a lot. Uh, but it makes sense because Chad wanted to really show off the spaces he was able to shoot in. Mm -hmm. I mean, shooting in the Louvre, like, how did you do that? He's like, yeah. COVID. <laughs> it was closed. <laughs> they let us in. It was just amazing. But, you know, because you want to demonstrate what you're able to shoot and Winston's walking through it and he wanted to create a space and, you know, Chad knows that we're going to do the guns and the fights and the cars the way that he's going to like them. But he wanted to make a particular point that spaces themselves had a character. You know, Dan did this amazing job and it was just so rich and detailed that he wanted it to sonically complement that. And uh, the there was a license to do it, but there was the footage to do it, too, you know? Winston didn't have those walks, or John didn't walk into the church, or whole myriad of other situations like that, you wouldn't have had it. And then, for sound, um, can't forget that we have a blind assassin. Yep. The sound's a huge part of this world. That's how he gets his story cues, what's going on. Uh, and that is written into the story. You know, and the cane, the cane. How much Foley... You know, how much Foley was done in this film? I know there there is quite a bit of Foley being being done in John Wick 4, but how much is actual production sound that just got embellished upon by Formosa? Uh, I would say it's all Foley. There's a couple of footsteps when, he, when Kane walks in to get um, sort of the mission, shall we say, from the marquee. Mm -hmm. There's some production in there. And when John, well, the church is in production. Uh, it's, I was going to say it's all Foley. Wow. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Wow. So, Some, yeah. Something that I notice in this film above the others is, number one, the multiplicity. We've got even more guns and more different kinds of guns this time, along with different car motors. But one of the great things is the ricocheting sound of the bullets versus the thwomp when it hits something. It, you have it so perfectly edited, Mark, so that we hear a gun fire, be it in the background or something in the foreground, particularly if it's John Wick firing something. We hear it getting the firing of it, you know, sometimes a whoosh, a sound of the bullet cascading through the barrel. 
But then we also, we're, we either hear a bullet hitting concrete, hitting something, or hitting the target. And I, the nuance and the differentiation that you bring in there, it's a great cause and effect situation. So the sound is perfectly synchronized with the action. Well, yeah, the sound, we were able to do what I call a duration. I mean, so you get a little bit more screen time. You can imagine a gunshot doesn't have much of screen time, but if it whizzes by you, hits something behind you, and then ricochets to the opposite corner of the theater, now it's got duration. And it lasts for a while. It can really play out. And we know that Chad likes that going in. Mm -hmm. So we are definitely going to search out for those opportunities. And the fact that we you know, mix the film and Atmos, even the surrounds, we use them. We create that space. That's part of the space of the reverb. That's part of the space of where you know, uh, bullets fly or, or something happens from on, off stage to on screen. Uh, definitely want to take every opportunity we can there because that's how you get that size and space, mm -hmm. be it an atmospheric sound or a specific sound. Yeah, the, the atmospheric sound, but I really noticed these ricochets, the cause and effect aspect with this film, and it could be because of the different sounds of gunplay, but it really, I really took note of it and was really impressed by that. Oh, good. Well, yeah, thanks. I mean, visually, they add a lot. And as I recently mentioned, they are adding bullet hits up until the last day, the last hour, the last mix, you know? So there's... <laughs> It's, such, it's a rich tapestry of that, and so I just talked about duration, if you have a couple singular sounds, but the fact that well, you can use the top shot as an example, mm -hmm. there were so many added visual details, and on most films, you want to, you, well, don't want to, you need to actually go subtract it. If you want clarity and texture and detail, you have to take things out or you're not going to hear things. John Wick was the opposite. John Wick was about added it because it seems like you couldn't add enough. Mm -hmm. You could never get in the way. It's like, well, let's add those shots. Let's add this. Let's add a gun for that. Let's make that off stage. Let's put some reverb on that. Typically, you do that, it builds up, it adds up, and you get too much. But that was not the case at all with this movie. It just made it better, like, to uh, what you're talking about. It, it really gave it that space, that intricacy of detail and, and relentlessness where it needs to be. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And then, by the same token, we get to the climactic duel. Our high noon western shootout, which, yeah. I mean, we had, I'm so, I was so thrilled to see that because that is the culmination of this, it's actually, this whole franchise has been a western. Um, yes. Oh my God, you're picking up all my story cues by saying that. That's great. But, I mean, and from... You played it like a western, right? Did you mean you heard the big canyon gunshots. Yep. I, I use black powder guns because it seems like that's, let's, let's play it like a vintage piece. I mean, so this... The guns are black powder. The wind is wispy like that blue sky wind that the old westerns had. You got crows that are cawing at certain times, you know? You, you've got that dry, like I said, dry wind. You've got, you know, the crunchy footsteps in the gravel that could be the dirt of a small western town. So it was fun to lean into all that because it was otherwise quiet in that scene. You could totally do it. I was giddy with that scene, Mark, because like the gravel, it, it you know, it reminded me of Gary Co Cooper walking across the dirt road, you know, the dirt main street in high noon with his spurs right. hitting, hitting the ground yeah. or, you know, spurs on a wooden decking in front of a storefront. Everything was just so John Ford. <laughs> I was... <laughs> I was... Well, yeah, Monument Valley, that's what I was looking to explain to somebody. Monument Valley, we, um, going for that vibe with uh, the echoes. And, you know, a lot, there's a lot of not just reverb added to the gunshots in the, in the um, scene, but also actual recorded echoes. So they, those shots swim and bounce around as if they were in Monument Valley, not in front of the soccer tour. So <laughs> that was completely a goal. Well, you definitely achieved that goal, Mark. For me, you achieved that goal because well, I, I immediately was thinking, here it is, high noon, Gary Cooper. Oh, that's good. You know. Yeah, I'll be happy because that was his goal, too. Bad day at Black Rock. 
everything about John Wick series could be Bad Day at Blackrock on multiple levels. Right. Well, you notice the, the sort of the vestiges of the good, bad, and the ugly in the score as well. Yes, absolutely. So. Some Marcone is is mixed in there. Some nice little nods yeah. in the scoring. A nod to that for sure. You know, which and, and I don't. You know, I would definitely say there's a lot of musical beats that really help. You know, the Arc of Triumph, that piece Joel Richard has. It's kind of like that driving techno. You know, when after the. Barracudas crashed, and mm-hmm. there's the big shootout amongst all the cars going the wrong way. And all, something like that really is helpful. But in that day, I always want to put a plug in for there's all sorts of non literal sounds as backgrounds in these scenes that we get to design and put in to create a feeling. Like I've used the example of the glass room mm-hmm. where he and Kane have their fight. I mean, there was no background in there until we came up with like a slowed down Buddhist chant because it was like a, you know, like an Asian uh, uh, museum of sorts. And then just had that feeding back amongst itself with reverb. And that created this undulating noise floor. Well, I wouldn't even call it noise floor, but it was almost musical. It was very tonal. And that created the backdrop of that scene. And it was, you know, subtle enough that it let the specifics like somebody stepping on glass to, notice that, you know, give Kane direction to where Wick might be. Mm-hmm. So sometimes those are some of my favorite moments because they really create a mood and a feeling, almost like you're talking about the fan and the scene with Killa does. Yeah. And sound is so important in a film, just like when you strip sound out of a scene. And a lot of people never, they don't get that. They don't think about that. And I just get so excited with when I hear all these little things that bring, that immerse me in the scene. It's one thing to look at it, it's one thing to see Dan's incredible lighting and the great action, but then I want that sensory experience that you give me with your sa- with the sound design and the sound edit. This is, I think, one of, one of the greatest pieces of work you've done, Mark, in your, in your immense career so well, far. Thank you. I mean... You're listening to the Academy's ears, we hope. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. But now I got to ask you, you know, because everything, with each film you want to do more than the film before. You want to do be better than the film before. And you and Chad yeah. and the teams, you have achieved that with each film. But when you, you have that, I got to be better. How do you go into a film like John Wick 4? It's one thing to say, yeah, we got to do better. Do you have any kind of idea after you've read the script how you can up your own ante? Well, somewhat of a complex answer to that. Um, I do always look at the environment that a film is in and how to make the most of that. Like you talked about from the scene in the desert to, you know, exterior landscapes in in Paris. And like, what is it going to take to make those things unique? I, I really look at the environment and when you peel the onion back of the John Wick story and end up in different locations, what to make the most out of those and knowing that the guns and the fights will always sound good and will always take what we've learned in the past and apply it and make them sound better, tighter, more articulate, you know? Like, oh, these kind of sounds for guns didn't work, so let's try something different. You know, Alan, you mentioned Alan Rankin. He prides himself in doing all the guns for all the John Wick movies. <laughs> and uh, you should get a lot of recognition for that because he's always finding new compression schemes and, and sort of, you know, EQ curves that he wants to use or new elements that, that he feels play together in a way better than previous films. And the same with a lot of the fights. You know, the, the, I'm not saying that we're recording new sounds, but we're making new sounds with what we have, just to make things tighter and more articulate. Mm-hmm. You know, I um, mean, you know, I'm not a fan of anything that's washy or slappy. Or there's certain sounds like I hate from the sound of like a loose gun. You'll hopefully never find that unless the director demands it on a film I work on. You know. But um, so there's things like that that you find that you like. And when it comes to hits, I don't like that cracky, bone crack, stereotypical old Western sound. Mm-hmm. So and those are two that come to mind. But so we have what we like and we try to lean into that and try to make the most of what we do like. And just try to make things just tighter. The whole idea is about extra detail. You know, all the details you mentioned, so then some. 
mm -hmm. what, what can we do to make, make more of it? And so each film, you look at those kind of details. You know, how are they writing the character? And then ultimately, I was able to see most of the dailies on this movie as it went. And so started to formulate ideas early on. Yeah, I was just going to say, that. how early do you get to actually step in and start working with the sound elements? film is a little bit unique in that um, Nathan and uh, Nicholas and Allie, the, Nathan was the picture editor, the other two were the assistants, mm -hmm. they did a lot of sound work as they cut the picture. Oh. So we would build libraries, we would make sounds, I would even shoot Foley and give them to them. And then they would come by the next stage where we might be working on something else and we'd play and go, okay, that's great. Maybe on the music, let's image it that way. Oh, here's a plug-in for your dialogue, and maybe that'll help. Oh, here's another one for the guys. And even though they might have had 24 tracks to work with between dialogue, sound effects, and music, they did an amazing job of really crafting how certain scenes would sound. So they, a lot of decisions came there. So as far as starting on it, I might have started on it when they were shooting as far as sending them sounds. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't officially start on it until we started a couple of months before we were going to actually mix the film. But all through the process, I was involved in helping to get sounds, make sounds, shoot fully, put things in, give little mixes of segments and things like that so they could build the track as we went. So we collaboratively came up with ideas which were mainly led by Nathan and team that we were able to sort of extrapolate into the next level. Well, Mark, so it's pretty awesome. All I can say is Oscar worthy, my friend. Oscar worthy. Well, thank you. This... Thank you very much. It means a lot. I will pass that along to all the people that work. For oh, because, please uh, do. We're all very proud of it. We love it when people appreciate all that work. And hopefully, I'll be talking to you in not too distant future about Silent Night. Yeah, I'm seeing it within the next That's couple a whole weeks. Discussion. That's right. I can't wait. Mark, thank you, thank you, thank you. It was so good to chat with you again. And hopefully sooner thank rather you sooner rather than later. All right. Bye bye, Mark. Promise, okay. Take care. All right, bye. Bye bye.